Now that I'm back from a traveling marathon, let's finish this top 10 strong. Oh, and better than my American version. You know, the version I was a bit newbie at. Get it? Number 5. Canadian Pacific 2317. Unlike 1246, which also has a less eventful history, 2317 is a member of the Canadian Pacific's earlier G3 Pacifics, and among 16 of the subclass G3C. She was built by Angus Shops in 1923 and used for hauling mainline passenger trains while stationed in Winnipeg, Manitoba for a good portion of its working life and was retired in 1959. But instead of being scrapped upon being retired, 2317 was instead placed into storage, which played a key role in its survival. In 1965, the 2317 was purchased from the railroad by, you guessed it, Mr. F. Nelson Blount, OF COURSE, who took the locomotive to Bells Falls, Vermont, where it became part of his Steamtown, USA collection. Then in 1978, the 2317 was restored to operational condition and painted in the Canadian Pacific's gray, blue, and Tuscan red livery despite never wearing it in revenue service a similar coincidence that Southern 4501 also shared. You may also remember that 1246 swapped between that livery and black several times during her operational career. After being restored, the 2317 ran excursions in the area until it was moved with the rest of the Steamtown collection to Scranton, Pennsylvania in 1984. The locomotive would arrive on January 31st. Four days later, she pulled the grand entrance ceremony and was fired up again on September 1st to pull the first Steamtown excursion in Scranton. That trip ran on the former Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western Main Line between Scranton and Elmhurst, Pennsylvania. During this time, 2317 was temporarily reverted to its original black paint scheme, which it wore during its revenue days with Canadian Pacific. Speaking of the earlier mentioned Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western Main Line, during the year 1986, 2317 was painted in that former railroad's Pocono Mountain Route livery, but was permanently returned to her original black paint scheme after the National Park Service took over Steamtown the next year. Not that I mind. 2317 also attended the grand opening of the Steamtown National Historic Site, along with Baldwin 26 and Canadian National 3254, and ran several excursions on the former Lackawanna Main Line. It would even doublehead with the visiting Gulf, Mobile, and Northern slash Blue Mountain and Reading Pacific number 425 during the year 1995. She even ran triple headers and had gatherings with 1246 and 1293 from time to time until they eventually left Steamtown. During its career, the 2317 was used to pull Steamtown's excursions in tandem with 3254 until 2004. But leading up to its end in that same year, Steamtown discovered problems with the 2317's trailing truck, dry pipe, and tires. From that point, the 2317 was limited to running Scranton Limited Yard Shuttle trains until new tires were installed in 2007. Afterward, she was allowed to run longer excursions to East Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, and the Delaware Water Gap. But after the end of the 2009 operating season, the 2317 was only used as a backup locomotive as its flu time was running short. Following a final run during Steamtown's 2010 Lackawanna Fest, the 2317 was retired and placed into storage in the Steamtown Roundhouse, where she has remained ever since. As of today, the 2317 is awaiting its FRA-mandated 1472-day inspection and restoration before it can operate again. According to Steamtown, they plan to restore the 2317 once they finish the restoration of Boston and Maine 3713. Number 4. Canadian Pacific 1278 The third CP Pacific on my list, 1278 is a member of the newer G5D Pacifics and among three surviving members. The others are 1286 and 1293. 1278 was built by Canadian Locomotive Company in 1948 and, similar to 1246 mentioned earlier, hauled freight and passenger trains throughout the Canadian Pacific system until it was retired from revenue service in December 1963. In 1965, the 1278, just like 1246, 1293, and 2317, was purchased from the CP by, you guessed it, Mr. F. Nelson Blount, OF COURSE, and taken to the location of its collection in Bells Falls, Vermont. Shortly after arriving at Steamtown, 1278 quickly became Blount's favorite locomotive. This resulted in him giving it the Steamtown Beauty treatment. 
They mounted an Alaska bundle-type feed water heater traversally across the smoke box and also moved the bell to the front, similar to how it is on Southern 1401. And finally, for the finishing touches, Blount had the 1278 repainted, re-lettered, and renumbered to Steamtown 127, the latter of which he simply removed the locomotive's last digit from its road number. Just like I pointed out when talking about 1246 in Part 1, Blount had planned to give his other CPG-5s the beauty treatment like 1278, so 1246 would become Steamtown 124, and 1293 would become Steamtown 129 with the same paint job that 1278-127 got. But the plan never came to fruition because Blount died in a plane crash on August 31st, 1967, at which point 1246 had just returned to Steam, and 1293 wouldn't be restored until 1973. Back to 1278-127, in 1968, Ross Rowland's High Iron Company sponsored a double-header excursion over the Central Railroad of New Jersey's main line between Jersey City and Wilkes-Barre, pulled by Canadian Pacific 1238 and 1286. But when the two engines had to be loaned to the city of Reading for emergency warmth after a steam generator broke down, the High Iron Company replaced them with the 127 along with Great Western Decapod number 90. Then from 1970 to 1971, the 127 was leased to the Kaladak and Lake City Railroad in Michigan, and after receiving some repairs, returned to Steamtown USA where it resumed operation. In 1973, the 127 masqueraded as a Delaware and Hudson Pacific, with said Pacific being number 653, the last of the original Delaware and Hudson Pacifics, for the 150th anniversary of the former Delaware and Hudson Railway. Granted, it didn't look exactly like the real 653, but it did look way better because those Pacifics were pretty hideous. At least they weren't as hideous as the B&M T1s or L&ER Thompson Pacifics. During the event, the Masquerading 127 even ran a doubleheader with Reading 2101, which was also masquerading as a Delaware and Hudson locomotive, albeit having better resemblance to one than 127 did to 653. During the same year, the 127 was reverted back to its Canadian Pacific livery and road number, but the Blount modifications remained. Right before Steamtown moved to Scranton, Pennsylvania, the 1278, along with the 1246, 1293, and 2317 ran excursions together as a farewell to their old home. After Steamtown moved to Scranton, Pennsylvania, the 1278 was taken out of service as it was in need of new flues. But it was here that the 1278's excursion career took a declining turn at the same time. The trains were reaching sizes that were too much for any of their G5s unassisted, and they didn't have any other operational steam locomotives that were strong enough for them. And so, in 1987, Steamtown went to the Gettysburg Railroad and traded 1278 for Canadian National 3254. At the time, it seemed like a good decision because 3254 was strong enough for Steamtown's needs. Plus, 3254 was a bit too heavy for the Gettysburg trackage, whereas 1278 was not, thus why the trade was made. While 3254 found a better life with Steamtown and fulfilled their needs, the Gettysburg would not make the same for the 1278. The Gettysburg moved the bell back to its former location and sometimes had the locomotive's railing painted yellow. That's fair. But they also replaced its Canadian National number plate with one of their own, which were Canadian National style number plates with the words changed to Gettysburg Railroad. Not suiting for a Canadian Pacific locomotive since both of those railroads have been rivals from the start. Now they're fighting over Kansas City Southern. But then of course, most notably, was the tragic ending of 1278's excursion career. Just eight years after joining the Gettysburg, on June 16th, 1995 at Garner's, the 1278 suffered a catastrophic ground sheet failure that resulted in a backdraft explosion in the firebox. The swarm of leaking hot steam badly burned all three crewmen in the cab. The engineer suffered the worst, with 60% of his body being burned but nobody was killed, and all 100 passengers on board the train escaped injury. Normally, a crown sheet failure would have resulted in a deadly boiler explosion, but the design of 1278's firebox prevented this as the crown sheet only bulged down. Not to mention that the boilers of the G5Ds were welded instead of riveted. 
but the crown sheet failure left the firebox with a bag-shaped bulge, a six-inch tear, and two broken stay bolts that fell into the ash pan below. The NTSB found out that the backdraft happened because the crew let the water level in the boiler drop too low. The NTSB also discovered that the Gettysburg had a bad reputation of maintaining their locomotives in a horrid fashion. In 1278's case, with the air compressor sounding like a donkey, rust on the wheels, and the water glass becoming clogged. This caused it to show a false water level, and on top of all that, the Gettysburg also failed to train the crew properly. As a result of this, the FRA had to impose the now infamous 1472-day inspection for any active steam locomotive in the United States. In 1996, a lot of the now ex-Gettysburg equipment, including the 1278, was purchased at an auction by Jerry Joe Jacobson and moved to his Age of Steam roundhouse in Sugar Creek, Ohio, as a possible parts donor for sister engine 1293. 1278 was eventually moved inside the roundhouse out of the elements, and was later touched up to improve its looks. As of today, the 1278 is still sitting on static display in the Age of Steam roundhouse, but it is likely that it will never run under its own power ever again. The story of 1278's end has become a critical history lesson for all, regardless of their career choice or interests. Maintain your equipment well, or bad stuff will happen to it. Number 3. Canadian National 3254 The only other pre-Canadian National locomotive on my list, she was built in 1917 by Canadian Locomotive Company for the Canadian Government Railways as 2854, but was renumbered to 3254 when the CGR merged with the Canadian Northern and became part of the Canadian National in 1918. 3254 is a member of the railway's S1B Mikados. These were pretty powerful Mikados that could climb grades with ease. On July 24th, 1941, 3254 was involved in a head-on collision with Great Northern Pacific Type number 1351. This left the 3254 with a bent frame and an off-centered cab. But despite the damage, Canadian National neglected to fix the frame, a decision that would haunt the 3254 for the rest of its life. 3254 pulled freight trains on the Canadian National system until she was placed into storage in February 1958 and retired shortly after. Then in November of 1961, Willis F. Barron purchased the 3254 and moved it to Ashland, Pennsylvania to run on the Reading Company's branch line that served the town. But due to the tracks in Ashland being pulled up before 3254 could operate there, Barron disassembled the locomotive and shipped it in pieces on a truck and reassembled it at his motel as a static display. But despite disassembling it, Barron didn't fix the frame but his reason for it is more preferable to why Canadian National didn't fix it in the first place. In 1982, the 3254 was purchased by the Gettysburg Railroad who restored it to operational condition and repainted it a bit. During its short life on the Gettysburg, 3254 pulled passenger trains on their trackage between Gettysburg and Mount Hollow Springs, Pennsylvania. Like mentioned in the number 4 segment, in 1987, the Gettysburg traded 3254 to Steamtown, and in exchange was given Canadian Pacific 1278 along with some extra cash. Again, 3254 was a bit too heavy for the Gettysburg trackage, 1278 was not. 3254 was strong enough for Steamtown's needs, and 1278 was not. Thus why it was a 50-95% to good move. As we all know, 1278's life fell apart thanks to Gettysburg's bad reputation of maintaining their locomotives in a horrid fashion, which led to 1278's tragic end. Meanwhile, 3254 enjoyed a pretty decent new life at Steamtown, where it became popular with it and crowds while under far better care than Gettysburg. It's also worth mentioning that Steamtown has another CN Mikado, number 3377, which became a parts donor for 3254. For its debut at Steamtown, 3254 masqueraded as Lockawana 1271, which would have been the next member if they ordered one more. At the beginning of the 1990s, 3254 was eventually fitted with a new whistle. 
its old whistle was in fact the origin of the cartoon whistle that you'd hear in a lot of old movies. <laughs> sounds really awesome. In fact, it's easily the best Canadian whistle I've ever heard. Then in 1995, the same year that 1278 went down, 3254 participated in the grand opening of Steamtown's main roundhouse alongside several other locomotives, including Canadian Pacific 2317, Baldwin 26, Blue Mountain and Reading 425, Susquehanna 142, and Milwaukee Road 261. The latter three were visiting. But after 15 more years of operation, in 2010, 3254's career started to take a steady decline when Steamtown found rust leaks in its tender. It was so bad, in fact, that they ended up scrapping the old tender and replacing it with the tender of 3377. But then there's the bigger problem. Thanks presumably to either the bent frame, previous port maintenance from Gettysburg, or even a mixture of both, 3254 developed a reputation of being a rough rider, as well as both chewing up bearings and consuming coal at an accelerated rate, especially compared to 2317, which was now the only CP Pacific they had left. After a final stand at the end of the 2012 holiday season, the bent frame resulted in 3254 being retired after 25 years of active service with Steamtown. This made 3254 the second longest serving locomotive at Steamtown, with only 2317 having served more years. As of today, the 3254 is sitting on display on the turntable at the Steamtown National Historic Site in Scranton, Pennsylvania. But due to her poor mechanical condition, 3254 is unlikely to run again for now. Therefore, she will be replaced with Boston and Maine 3713 once its restoration is complete. At least 3254's end wasn't as devastating nor depressing as 1278's. Number 2. Canadian Pacific 2839. I had considered putting this on the number 1 spot for a long time, but I changed my mind while I was out. This beauty is one of 45 Canadian Pacific streamlined Hudsons and among 30 of the subclass H1C, delivered in 1937 from Montreal Locomotive Works. They were basically newer versions of the previous H1A and B Hudsons, but with beautiful streamlining. Typical CP. That's good by the way. They were initially just referred to as streamlined Hudsons at first, but that changed when in 1939, while being taken on a transcontinental train trip across Canada by Hudson 2850 in 1939, the newly coronated King George VI of England was so impressed with the performance and looks of these locomotives that after the trip, the King gave Canadian Pacific permission to display royal crowns on their running board skirts and nicknamed them Royal Hudsons. Aside from the H1Cs and Ds, the latter H1Es were also allowed the same treatment. Um, that's engines 2860 through 2864. 2839 and the other H1Cs, along with the 10 H1Ds, served with the Canadian Pacific, hauling passenger and freight trains east of the Rocky Mountains until retirement for 2839 came in 1959. She was initially intended to be placed on display in a museum in eastern Canada, but in a plot twist, she ended up in the hands of a group of owners in Pennsylvania. After being given a full restoration, the 2839 was leased to the Southern Railway starting in 1979, as well as being given Southern lettering, as well as a Southern five-chime whistle. During her career on the Southern, 2839 earned the nickname Beer Can due to the Royal Hudson streamlined design. Um, not to insult Canadian Pacific Royal Hudson enthusiasts, including myself, because I don't agree with them nicknaming it like that. Anyway, 2839 also appeared in the award-winning movie, Coal Miner's Daughter, but retained her Southern lettering in the movie, even though the Southern never owned any Hudsons. 2839 rocketed along the prairies and hills of the American South, pulling excursion passenger trains full of joyful tourists. But in 1980, the trains had become so popular, and so much longer, 
that they became too heavy for the 2839 to handle on its own. Because of this unfortunate bad turn of luck, in 1980, the 2839 was returned to Pennsylvania, while its successor, the strong but slow-dragging Texas and Pacific 610, and later Firebox cracked Chesapeake and Ohio 2716 took over. Upon being returned to Pennsylvania, the 2839 was stored at the Blue Mountain and Reading Railroad in Allenton, Pennsylvania. The BMNR attempted to restore the 2839 to operational condition, but the plans fell through when the 2839 was purchased from them. Through a number of owners, the locomotive was eventually shipped on a flat car to the Nethercut Collection at Silmar, California, where it was cosmetically restored and put on display outside the museum. As of today, the 2839 is the only Canadian Pacific Royal Hudson that is currently preserved outside of Canada and among four surviving members. The other members in question are 2850, 2858, and the most famous of them, number 2860. 2839 is also one of two members to have run an excursion service. But had she been in the hands of the right operator, she could have had greater potential alongside the distant 2860. As usual before I unmask my number one, how about some honorable mentions first? locomotive could top a specimen of Canada's most beautiful steam locomotive. The locomotive in question is the only one in this part to have been in Canada its whole life, compared to the rest having moved to America. It also has something that fellow excursion stars from its company didn't have, and feats that they never got to accomplish. Canadian National U1F Mountain number 6060. Feel free to comment how easy or hard it was to guess. But anyway, 6060 was built by Montreal Locomotive Works in 1944 as the first of 20 Canadian National U1F Mountains. They were a step down in size compared to the larger Northerns, but were faster as a result. The distinctive feature of these locomotives were their famous cone-shaped smokebox door covers which earned them the nickname of Bullet Nose Bettys. 
It's also worth mentioning that half of the U1Fs, including 6060, originally burnt coal, but were converted to burn oil and had their original coal tenders replaced with oil ones in October 1944. 6060 pulled high-speed passenger and freight trains across Canada until she was retired in favor of diesels in 1960, but instead of being scrapped, the 6060 became one of three U1Fs to escape the cutter's torch and was placed on static display in Jasper, Alberta in 1962. The other survivors are 6069 and 6077. Ten years later, CN restored the 6060 to operational condition for use in their steam program, succeeding U2G Northern 6218 as the railway's main excursion locomotive. 6060 served its second career with CN, pulling passenger excursion trains until she was retired for the second time in 1980 when CN ended their steam program due to the high operating costs of steam locomotives. But then in the early 1980s, Harry Holm purchased the 6060 and took it to Alberta to run more excursions. Harry had fallen in love with the 6060 upon first meeting it in 1945, at which point he was 12 years old. Then in 1985, Harry and some friends of his took the 6060 to Jasper as it was in need of an extensive refurbishment. He also had hopes of finishing the refurbishment in time for the locomotive to attend Expo 86 in Vancouver, British Columbia. After five months of hard work, and a few days after Expo 86 started, 6060's big restoration was finally finished and she steamed again. The day that 6060 ran again was also Harry's birthday, which resulted in his friends wrapping a bow on the revived 6060 to surprise Harry. 6060 finally arrived late at the Expo with a few days to spare, where she and Harry were greeted by whistle blasts from all the other locomotives there. Those included CN 1392, CP-1201, and the legendary Royal Hudson 2860, along with several British and American locomotives, including Rocket and UP-4466. During its time at Expo 86, 6060 could be seen running along with the other locomotives at the Expo. And when the Expo concluded, 6060 returned to Jasper in a doubleheader with 2860. This became known as the Squamish Doubleheader, and a very historical event. After the doubleheader, 6060 moved to the Alberta Prairie Railway Museum in Stettler, Alberta, where she has remained ever since. 6060 became the largest locomotive in the fleet, and continued to run excursions until 2012, when it was taken out of service for another rebuild. As of today, the 6060's rebuild is still ongoing. But in 2020, the same year that Harry Holmes passed away, the Rocky Mountain Railway Society announced that they will continue the restoration of 6060 once they have raised enough funding. They have been responsible for 6060 since 2009. While restoring and operating a big steam locomotive in recent years has been a formidable challenge, they continue to see projects overcome the odds time and time again. You can donate money to help them raise the amount needed to get this bullet-nosed mountain back in action. Never say never for 6060. The facts that this locomotive was among three steam locomotives using Canadian National Steam Program, many locomotives to attend Expo 86, and her roller coaster career and travels across the west and east sides of Canada, including those epic doubles with 2860, really earned it a spot in the top five from the get go. Her reputation for being the only locomotive on my list to have run more than just farewell excursions and last beyond the 70s and into recent times, while having been in Canada its whole life, the only one of my picks that is currently getting refurbished, and being the only streamlined Canadian National Steam Locomotive to run an excursion service, made the 6060 my number one on my top 10 retired steam excursion stars from Canada, the next door neighbor to America where I live. I don't think I need to say any more beyond this point. Roll the credits.
vivir un 